It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show, only on Secular Media Network. Welcome back, everybody. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to the cleverly titled Phil Ferguson Show. Later in the show, we will have an interview with Robert H. Frank. He wrote a book called Success and Luck, and it explores the uh, impact, the influence of success on uh, determining who wins. Uh, It could be uh, business, it could be sports, and sometimes the best person doesn't win. Sometimes luck plays a little bit of a role, and we're going to discuss that. And we're also going to discuss some theories that he has on uh, taxation, uh, U.S. tax code in particular. And so I think you'll find that absolutely fantastic. And a couple of uh, investing skeptically topics that we have for today. One is about market returns and uh, mutual funds and, and how they do and what that data might be worth if you look back at past performance. The other part is in reference to the uh, SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. I have talked previously about uh, one of uh, my clients or a new client had talked to their representative at a big brokerage firm, and they said that they would simply move their shares from A class to C class when the new fiduciary rule comes into place from the Department of Labor, and that by doing that, they would be in compliance, not necessarily with the intent of the law, in my opinion, but with the letter of the law, uh, the problem for the client or you, the listener, if you have uh, an account at one of these big brokerage firms, if they switch you from A share funds, where you paid a load from three to eight and a half percent up front for the theoretical trade-off of lower expense ratios, which are probably still way too high and you shouldn't be paying them to the C shares, which have no upfront load, but a considerably higher expense ratio. Uh, So what the end result is you end up paying the load up front to get the lower fees and then you don't get the lower fees. And somehow uh, his broker thought that that would be a really good thing to do to customers. So it might make them in compliance because now you're not paying money for the transaction. You're paying the money on an ongoing basis, which makes it more like what a fiduciary might do, but it's still really, really bad advice. So I I was very amused by that, and we talked about that several episodes ago and how that would be a problem. Well, apparently the SEC has caught on to this, and they've put out a brand new alert, um, and it's called, uh, the alert is called Share Class Examination Initiative. And so they're going to start looking into the class of shares of the mutual funds. Now, first of all, this only applies generally to load funds. So if you have an account at a brokerage firm or you have a financial advisor somewhere or whoever is helping you when you get your quarterly statement, look at the specific names of the funds that you are in. If it's such and such fund A or such and such fund L, M, R, At the very end, there's just a random letter hanging out there. That tells you that that is a load fund. Now, that fund may not have a front-end load. That's usually the A shares, and they have B shares and C shares. A, B, and C generally mean the same thing across the industry, but there's no rules for that. They they just It's a convention, so they follow that. If you're in a 401k, you may have M shares or Z shares or R shares, And that may mean that they waive magically the front end load because they're so awesome and you're in a 401k and they they claim that because you're part of a big company, you don't have to pay the load. Awesome. But you may have an expense ratio that instead of being 1.2 or 1.4 is 1.6 or 1.8. So you got to check that stuff out and take a look at it. If none of that makes sense to you or you want an another person to look at it, you can, of course, contact me, Phil, at PolarisFinancialPlanning.com. Do not send the document in your first email. Make sure that you have reached me. Make sure that I call you. So please include your phone number. We'll have a conversation. And if we both think it's worthy of looking at, 
then and only then can you send me a document. Do not send your confidential banking and investment information via email the very first time. I mean, we could argue whether that's even a good idea at all, but at least make sure it goes to me. So uh, here's what this uh, alert says in it, and I'm going to read a little bit of a quote here, so forgive me. Hang on a second. We're going we're gonna, to, it's like a really long sentence, two sentences, I guess, but I'm going to read it because I want to make sure you get it as it's written. So hang on, and we're going to do this quote from the SEC alert on share class. Quote, an investment advisor has failed to uphold its fiduciary duty when it causes a client to purchase a more expensive share class of a fund when a less expensive class of that fund is available. As a fiduciary, an advisor has an obligation to act in its client's best interest and disclose material conflicts of interest, such as the receipt of compensation for selecting or recommending mutual fund share classes, end quote. So there you have it. That's a new thing that the SEC is going to start uh, checking people on. And when uh, advisors get audited, they're going to specifically look for that. So I thought that was very interesting that just a few weeks ago, I, I talked about that. And now it's going to be something that uh, they're going to actually actively look for. The other general topic is past performance in I've talked about it in the past some but it's been a while on this specific topic and and what I tend to get is people calling me and saying hey I've already met with an advisor and they have recommended these certain funds and the funds that they've recommended have beat the market over the last one three five or ten years isn't that fantastic and can you do better than that well, from a skeptic perspective and from 20 plus years in the financial services industry, when someone asks me that question, I get what they're trying to do. Their intent is to get really good products. I get that. What they do not understand, and I mean this in the kindest way possible, is that that question is almost nonsensical and counterproductive. So the first part can I pick better funds than the, what the person picked for you? Well, sure as fuck I can. I get a database every quarter that has 30, 35, 40,000 mutual funds in it. And I can click on a column and sort it by any time frame you want, one, three, five, ten years of performance. And then I can go in there and pick a fund or a handful of funds that have done an amazing job and hand those to you. And the, let's say the market return for the 10 years is 7.3. Your advisor created a portfolio for 8.5. I'll create one that returns historically 10. Okay, great. So I now did what you asked. Does that mean that it's a better portfolio? Probably not. Uh, so it, it's kind of a, a tricky thing. So what I wanted to do in this episode was take a very specific example. So I took that big fancy schmancy database that I get and I looked at the last 10 years of data and how different mutual funds have done and I've limited this to uh, mutual funds that are primarily if not 100% U.S. stock market. I didn't look at uh, all U.S. stock market. I looked at large cap because the S&P 500 to be fair is large cap it doesn't include small and mid cap capitalization is the size of the company measured by the number of shares outstanding times the price of the shares. So this is going to be all the companies that you know, the names that you recognize. They're the 500 biggest companies. And I also limited funds that don't have uh, a, a blend strategy. So they're, they're trying to buy either large cap growth. You know, they want the growth funds, the funds that are going up the fastest or the value funds. And value funds typically don't go up as fast, but pay higher dividends. And both of those categories tend to make the same 10% in the long run. But in the short run, you can get variations. So I'm trying to be as fair as possible. So I'm going to compare large blend U.S. mutual funds to the index that most accurately measures that is the S&P 500. And what I did was I took five years of data 
2006, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Five years of data, and we're pretending like it's now 2011, and we've just, a couple years in the rearview mirror was 2008, the horrible year where the S&P 500 went down 37%. And we're going to look at all of the funds that fit this categorization, that have 10 years of data, which, by the way, is about 757 funds. And I want to look at what the best ones did. So in that time frame, the S&P 500 made a positive return of 12%. Yes, that's correct. The five years that included 2008, where it went down 37%, the total return over those five years was still a positive 12%. Not great for five years. I mean, you know, we're talking two, two and a half percent a year, but still up 12%. When I looked at all of the funds that were available, and I look now at the top 20, not the top 20%, but the top 20, the 20 best performing funds that met all the previous criteria, they returned an average of 44.6%. So, the market returned 11, and the top 20 funds returned 44.6%. Not bad. And the bottom performing ones out of all this category, just for fun, I figured I'd check that too, uh, they didn't do so well. Uh, they had an average return of minus 17%. So when the market went up almost 12, the 20 worst went down 17%. You hopefully didn't own those. You definitely don't want to own those. And if you look at a ranking of five-year performance, they're going to show up as the dogs of the dogs of the dogs. Don't fucking buy those, right? They sucked. Of course, based on historical information, they sucked. So you think, all right, I'll buy a basket of the top 20 best ones. And that's, you know, they beat the market for five years. That's fantastic. So let's magically leap forward in time to five years later and we're now going to look at performance over the calendar years uh, 16 15 14 13 12 no i'm sorry i'm starting an indent 15 because 16 is not done yet i wanted to use a full year so we've got 11 12 13 14 15 the next five year period and during that next five year period the total return of the of the uh the best funds now, remember, you pick the 20 best funds from the previous five years, and you own them for five years, the average return is 56%. So over five years, 56%, not bad. Over five years, you're, you're looking about 10, 10.5%. And if you look at just that, you might say to yourself, wow, I know the market makes about 10% a year. My funds are making about 10% a year. I didn't really beat the market by much, but... I did okay. And let's look at the 20 worst funds. And I got to scroll down to that. The 20 worst funds did not return 56% like the uh, the best ones did. They returned 61, wait, what? 61%? Holy crap. You made 5% more by buying the shitty ones. The absolute 20 worst funds from the first five years beat, on average, the 20 best funds from the previous five years. Absolutely staggering. So that historical data, in this case, was not only not helpful, it was hurtful. You lost money by picking the best funds. This is how it works. The, the funds that did the best did best for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe they happen to have 30% cash on hand when 2008 hit. Maybe they happen to waiver from their long-term plan and didn't have uh, stocks, but they had more bonds when the market went down. Maybe they're not supposed to do that, but they did. They have the flexibility to, to adapt. And whatever it is they did may, that helped them when the market went down may have hurt them when the market went up. You have no idea. Maybe they changed managers. Maybe they had 20% of their money in one stock that made them a huge success and then that stock did poorly or they sold it and now they have an overweighting in something else that did poorly. The past information does not have a predictive value when selecting one mutual fund versus another. It just is not helpful. And a lot of magazines will print the best funds for the last 12 months or three years or five years. They generally don't do 10 years. 
but the same thing applies. That data is fun and it's entertaining and it